Well, good morning and a warm welcome to Blackburn Presbyterian Church. Thank you for joining us. If you're visiting, uh, we really would like you to leave a comment uh, if you have any thoughts or questions or reflections that you would like to make on our Facebook uh, page uh, following this live stream. Since February the 2nd, we've been reflecting in this church on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Back then, we had no idea about the input that COVID-19 would have on us all. I'm grateful to Ken Margo and Jacob Bradbeer for helping us get streaming live. This is our seventh Sunday streaming, various elements of our service. I'm also grateful to Ken for uploading a PDF of our regular Sunday leaflet to the church webpage, blackburnpc.org.au. If you'd like to know a little more about our church, feel free to download that or have a look at it online at the website. The uh, previous studies are all outlined there and uh, you can find a bit more about our place in, uh, as a small church in uh, Melbourne. This week we've also had input, helpful input, from uh, members of the congregation, from uh, Peter Gadsby in New South Wales and from Josh Reed at Fairy Meadow Anglican Church in Wollongong, New South Wales. Uh, thank you, Josh. You've been most encouraging and especially helpful with uh, detailed streaming advice. That's much appreciated. This week, I'd also like to thank Rachel Tress of Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, for permission to use her illustration on the cover of the leaflet. Uh, I'll be showing that on the screen a little later, but her beautiful illustrations can be found at racheltress.com. Today, in the light of our global pandemic, I invite you to worship God as we pray, hear the singing of God's praises, listen to the scriptures being read and reflect upon them, and express anew our dependence upon and gratitude for the Lord Jesus Christ. So let us begin with prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that despite the pandemic that has shut down so much in our community, that we can be connected uh, using technology in ways which we perhaps never imagined we would become so dependent upon. We know that there are losses, but we thank you too that there are things which are positive in this situation. As your church connects worldwide using the media at its disposal, we pray that you would strengthen us to be your people, to play our part in uh, bringing health, healing and hope wherever there is despair. Our Heavenly Father, hear us in this our prayer and connect us in this service. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I couldn't resist the temptation when I discovered uh, this old friend of mine. This is Evan MacDonald. Evan was best man at my wedding 50 years ago, and uh, he was, uh, has been very active in his lifetime promoting the singing of the Psalms. And this is a clip looking at his image from a few years ago, I think. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm sure Evan won't mind. This is uh, part of a psalmody conference, and the singing is of Psalm 121. Many of the Psalms express their dependence upon God that we find Jesus encouraging in the Sermon on the Mount. And in fact, of course, the Beatitudes which begin the Sermon on the Mount are drawn largely from the Psalms. So have a, a moment's reflection as you listen to this uh, singing of the 1650 version of uh, Psalm 121.
Well, every week it seems there's something new to learn. And um, as some of you know, Graham's laptop is in hospital still. And so I am um, reading, but also being involved in swiping on Graham's iPad so that what I'm reading matches what's on the screen. I think Graham decided to do this because some people find me hard to hear or understand, whereas others found me easy to hear and understand. So here we go. We are reading from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 34. Do not store, sorry, I'm just being told I have to swipe. Okay, so the section I'm reading. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break through and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air, as they were featured on the leaflet. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And may God especially bless this reading to us in this challenging time of COVID-19. Thank you, Christine. It had nothing to do with pe thinking people found you difficult to understand. Uh, so I apologize if that was an obscurity. Um, 
The, the theme that I have today is, as Christine suggested, built around this large chunk of the Sermon on the Mount. Last week we just looked at two verses, uh, but this week we've taken a larger chunk and we're moving from Jesus' discussion of our private and devotional personal life, our fasting, our praying, and our, our giving, to things that are more open and obvious, in a sense, our public life. And uh, the image that I've used is connected with the idea of the birds. Consider the birds of the air. I don't know about you, but in this time of lockdown, I've been hearing more bird song in the morning. Uh, when we go for a walk, we listen for particular, uh, particular places for particular birds. Friends have put onto Facebook images or the sound of, uh, of uh, the bird song in the morning. Uh, so we're a little bit more aware of this sort of thing. So here is Rachel Tress's uh, illustration, that, which accompanies a little poem, which I'll come to later. So Rachel Tress illustration, I emailed her when I asked uh, if I could use this image, and she was very gracious and agreed to let me use it on the leaflet, and here we are. Lockdown, but detecting more to life. And I think Jesus' words come through with a new power and force as we think about them. Uh, in this present situation. Lockdown, detecting, mortal life. And there are really two main ideas in the verses. The first one is about material things. Uh, We are invited to rethink materialism by Jesus. And I think when we're locked down and many of the things that are part of our busy rushing around lives are no longer accessible to us and our lives are stripped down to less activity and simpler things, we have a chance to reassess what really matters. And the implications and the thrust of what Jesus has to say is this, that your life, your real life, is so much more than the things that we normally obsess about. So let's take these two ideas, firstly material things, and and look at the three things Jesus says about them, and then we'll go on to Look at the idea of more in our lives. First of all, Jesus talks about lasting treasure. And I'm sure as Christine was reading, you would have uh, had words pop into your head, sayings that we use, where your treasure is there, will your heart be also. And we also have that section which is less obvious to us about the the lamp of the body being the eyes. And uh, so we need to think about what Jesus meant there. And then... He talks about having your loyalty sorted. You cannot serve God and money. What was he meaning? All of these ideas come from the first part of the reading, Matthew 6, verses 19 through 24. So let's think about these three things. First of all, lasting treasure. Uh, I like Alan Kohler's uh, input on the uh, ABC News, the financial situation. He always seems to have a quirky little graph or comment about this or that, which makes you think, how seriously are we taking all of this? Uh, The Standard & Poor uh, uh, Index is is an indicator, for example, of the top 500 uh, companies, listed companies in the United States, and it's down, dramatically down. And uh, the stock market is down and people are wondering where their wealth is going. Uh, Some people have accessed their superannuation early. Income is down and some people have lost it. And the government has been uh, legislating to make sure that uh, people uh, who are looking for work will have adequate uh, to help them get by and people who are hoping to keep work will have that job keeper allowance and that companies will Uh, take that up and and maintain staffing in whatever way they can. Uh, So so we're in a time when we're questioning our wealth. And Jesus is here talking about lasting treasure. Lasting treasure. Something that doesn't rot. Something that doesn't rust. Something that cannot be stolen. Imagine that. So... The whole chapter, with its earlier themes of the inner life, is pointing us to something else, something beyond. Treasure that will not rust, 
and or get stolen or uh, be in any way diminished, devalued. And, and it made me think uh, of many things. Um, what is legal tender? The cryptocurrency Bitcoin is, uh, <laughs> has been up and down like the stock market as well. Is there a, a new kind of currency going to emerge from all this? Is there going to be some kind of realignment of the nations and all the nations' wealth? Well, I don't know about that. But Jesus is certainly making clear that there is something that will last into the future. What might that be? Well, you too have a song called All That You Can't Leave Behind. I'm sure you know the story of the, uh, the uh, question that was asked at a, at a funeral in the Sydney Cathedral, St Andrew's Cathedral. Uh, an eminent identity had died, a wealthy person, and the question uh, that if somebody leaned forward to ask the person in the few in front was, how much did he leave? And the, uh, the uh, intended reply was, uh, the reply was heard as, all of it, all of it. So it is. We can't take our wealth with us. But I've stood by many a graveside and, and actually at a viewing as well many times. And you realize that the person you loved has gone from the body that they, they inhabited. The body is precious, but the person has gone. The life has gone. The personality has gone. The things that we carry into the future might be very different from the things we treasure now. The smile of your grandchildren. I wonder if you've ever been brought to the verge of tears and enjoy at the same time looking at a, an old photograph that captured a moment. Perhaps smiles could be the currency of heaven. Perhaps it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the patience and the kindness and the gentleness. The nine things that are enumerated by the Apostle Paul, these things, the fruit of the Spirit, these things disappear. We take them with us into our future. Uh, but there are things we cannot take and there are things that we will take. Imagine the currency of heaven. It's not the same as here. You two put it in this song. What you've got, they can't deny it, can't sell it or buy it. Walk on, walk on, leave it behind. You've got to leave it behind. All that you fashion, all that you make, all that you build, all that you break, all that you measure, all that you steal, leave it behind. So that's the first thing. Think about what you treasure now. Secondly, we need to think about lighting up our lives. One of the uh, commentaries uses the illustration of the headlights of a car. When, when it's night time and you switch on the lights, the whole vista in front of you opens up. And uh, you can move freely. You know where you're going. You have direction. And Jesus is saying to us that we need purpose. We need to know where we're going. We're not like... As one other commentator puts it, we're not like plankton drifting aimlessly in the sea of life. Uh, the uh, New York Times bestseller by Rick Warren is perhaps on your shelf somewhere, The Purpose Driven Life. Why did that book sell 40 million copies? Because people were hungry for purpose. And as Rick Warren says in the first chapter, and it might be as close as the first verse, that your life is not about you, it's about God and you as God's image bearer. So here we are. What is it that enables you to work, walk purposely through life? What is the, the, the uh, compass that orients you in the, in the right direction? What is the light that illumines your pathway? Well, clarity and direction of purpose, something that God wants us to have and he wants us to have good vision, 2020 vision. Maybe this is the year for this. And then the last part of that initial section is where Jesus says you need to get your loyalty sorted out because you cannot serve two masters. 
You can hold down two jobs, I guess. But Jesus is talking about being the slave of a master. He's talking from a different culture. And the choice here is having God as your master or having money as your master. I'm sure you know the old saying that money makes a great servant, but a vicious master. If money masters you and drives your life, the results will be catastrophic. Catastrophic for relationships, uh, catastrophic in all kinds of ways. Uh, so, so we're encouraged here to think about what it might mean to be a servant of God, as Jesus was, the servant of God, and to minister and bring help and health and healing and salvation into people's lives. So you cannot uh, be the servant of both God and money. You need to have it sorted out. You need to give God the primacy and the priority in your life. Especially if you want your life to discover the moreness that Jesus is talking about here. And this is the second half of that reading from Christine. There are three things again here. There's the menu, the wardrobe, and the worry. Three things to think about that all come out of the second half of that, that passage. Matthew 6 verses 25 to 34. Let's just think for a moment about the menu. Well, I thought I needed reminding of the name. I wrote down my kitchen rules and then I thought, oh no, there was another one. What was that called? And I thought, oh, I can't just get it. Maybe it's my age. Maybe it's just I never watched it often enough. Uh, so I thought I'd check online to see about that other kitchen show. And I found a website which listed the cooking shows around the world and there were hundreds of them, hundreds of them. They began with all the ones that began with A, B, C and it worked through the alphabet. Um, the other one, of course, that I couldn't remember was MasterChef. But there was another one which I remember seeing a bit, I think it was on SBS, uh, Iron Chef, or as we say in Australia, Iron Chef. So here, here we are, we're living in an environment where cooking shows have immense appeal. And we've got so much food, as I mentioned last week, uh, that, that we can draw on the massive amounts of food. And alas, we waste enormous amount of food too, as I mentioned with Second Bite and other agencies picking up and delivering to people who don't have enough. So the menu dominates uh, popular viewing on television, and, and so we need to ask ourselves, how much do we get invest in thinking about food? It's wonderful to be in a country where we have food security. But, you know, at the moment in East Africa, there's a locust plague. I've been reading about it for a couple of weeks in uh, different, uh, agent, through different agencies. And the people in the, North, in the Horn of Africa, they don't have food security, but they... They're starting to get the virus as well. How do we care about them? Well, how do they make provision for the future? This is a challenge for us. We need to think about this very question, the menu. What do we want to put on the menu? How much of our time does it take up? One of the books I read recently was about a man in a lockdown situation. It's called The Gentleman in Moscow. Every day began with breakfast. It was a biscuit, a piece of fruit, and a coffee. And each day they enumerated what the fruit was today. When I look at the fruit on our fruit platter at home, I think, what an abundance I have, really. So the menu. How easily we become obsessed about the menu and we worry about it. What about the wardrobe? Do you worry about the wardrobe? I noticed this week's Good Weekend has uh, information about who's going to be walking on the catwalks of Europe and what they'll be wearing, and uh, we're being encouraged again to look at fashion. Do you worry about clothing? Is it a, a, a preoccupation? You know, in, uh, it's hard to avoid fashion. I hesitate to say that I once had a pink suit with bell-bottom trousers. I don't know if you can imagine that. Uh, I w once had a shirt with Edward Degas' ballerinas all across it. It was a gift from somebody, so I wore it. Somebody in my church, actually. So, 
So we do, we do find fashion invades our lives. But is it, is it something that uh, dr drives us or uh, we feel we have to keep up with? It's a, it's a challenging time. We need to think about, about fashion. And the, tr the trouble is that we can so easily slip into worrying about all of these things. Uh, are we anxious about it? More people are more anxious in lockdown than we were before. And uh, Jesus says that worry achieves nothing. You can't add to your height. You can't add to your length of days. Worry does not make a difference except perhaps shorten your length of days. So here we are. Jesus' priorities, do they come first in our lives? How are we helped by what Jesus is saying here? He's saying our life is more than these things. These are petty things by comparison. There is more to life. And I come back to this little poem. Uh, and it's, uh, let me read it to you. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, Friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. So if you imagine this conversation between the birds, the robin and the sparrow, so beautifully illustrated by Rachel Tress in these two little diagrams, uh, we are reminded that Jesus is telling us that God is our Father. He knows our needs. He knows we need to eat. He knows we need to be clothed. We need a place to sleep. We need safety and security. These are on his agenda. But if we make his agenda first, we'll find everything else falls into place. If we elevate these things to the top spot, we'll end up achieving none of the things we really want. We need to let our eyes think things through. We need to work out rationally in our minds what is going to have priority with us, what's treasure to us, what's, what's going to be the enduring things, uh, and who we are going to serve. And once we've got that sorted, we need to take away the, the worry of these things and leave them with our Father who, who loves us and wants to pursue the best for us. Amen. May we find God helping us with this through this coming week. We're now going to pray. Once again, our prayers will uh, cover the situation that we're experiencing with this uh, virus. And... Uh, we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. And I invite you to uh, take this time uh, to give thanks to God for all he has done for us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, at the invitation of Jesus, we come to you this morning and again lay our concerns, large and small, before you, confident that for the sake of your beloved Son, you hear and answer prayer. Thank you that some Australian states have no active cases of COVID-19. And across the country there is encouraging progress so that plans are cautiously being made to ease restrictions. Thank you that in some badly affected countries there is now a reduction in new infections and in the number of deaths. Thank you too for research and development focused on vaccine and treatment. Thank you for kindness and creativity that have come to the fore to comfort and help people adjust to enforced isolation. Thank you for government assistance pledged to assist the vulnerable aged care sector in particular. We pray for those who are apprehensive, frightened, ill, as well as the bereaved. May they receive honest reassurance, real comfort, and true consolation in the face of their loss and adversity. We pray for family and friends around the world, especially those in aged care facilities with already compromised health concerns and where there has been a, the distress of a COVID cluster. We pray that under-resourced poorer nations will be treated generously by the wealthy in terms of personal protective equipment, test kits and breathing equipment. 
We pray too that we will be sensitive to countries where famine, locust plague and terrorism add dreadful complexity to the spectre of the pandemic. We pray for families with reduced or total loss of income and struggling for direction, where working from home is complicated by homeschooling and where tensions are raised by frustration and anger. Remind us, Lord, once again, to love one another as you have loved us. Holy Spirit, lead us with ideas and energize us how to show love in action. May the Spirit of Christ reign in our hearts and lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. And the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And a word of benediction. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, work in all of us his will, that which is pleasing and perfect in his sight. To his name's praise and glory. Amen. <laughs>